Uh, these are trying times and we need, at the very least, we need folks to understand what's really going on and what's at stake for uh, our democracy and our future in North Carolina. But the title of today's event and why we're here is Why is America So Divided and What Can We Do About It? A conversation with award-winning filmmakers and founders of the Coffee Party, and we have one of them here, Annabelle Park. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Annabelle. Annabelle and her partner Eric, Eric Byler are filmmakers known for innovative ways in which they've combined emerging social media tools with grassroots organizing. They are founders of Coffee Party USA, a grassroots democracy movement which emerged in early 2010 as a fact-based, imagine that, <laughs> a civil alternative to the Tea Party with over half a million people in their network. They also co-directed the critically acclaimed documentary feature film about America's culture war over immigration policy, 9500 Liberty. That film won four film festival awards and was released theatrically in more than 30 cities and picked up MTV network, picked up by MTV networks for a September 26, 2010 cable premiere. Their new documentary web series, soon to be developed into a feature film, Story of America, A Nation Divided, examines the ways in which America has been divided as a country, investigates the causes, and invites the audience to share their stories about America and engage in a dialogue about how we can become more united. They're in Raleigh to attend tomorrow's HK on J Rally in celebration. And if you haven't already, don't already know about it, there's postcards in the back on the table. I really hope that everybody in this room can, can march uh, and demonstrate and go to the rally tomorrow. It starts at 9.30 uh, near Shaw University. Just look for the McDonald's near Shaw uh, and there'll be a folks assembling marching to the legislative building and hear, hearing speakers about what's happening. Uh, according to the filmmakers, America's growing national divide jeopardizes the country's future. The polarization is making Washington dysfunctional, and I would add Raleigh to the list, uh, and our lives more difficult because our government is paralyzed by gridlock. In their work they ask, how can we break this gridlock and become more united as a country? So. Join me in welcoming uh, the filmmaker Annabelle Park. Hi. Um, let's see. I heard that generally speaking, you, you guys have a presentation and there's Q&A. Um, but I want to try to mix it up a little bit and, and see if we can really make this a conversation. Which means you can interrupt me anytime. <laughs> And someone has to stop me from talking at the end because I could go on and on and on. <laughs> so someone start waving and say, please, in the conversation. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you for being here. I'm shocked that you all came so early. Because when I found out the time, I was like, okay, we're going to get a few people. <laughs> but um, it's really nice to see everyone. Um, I'm, I'm kind of delighted that you're interested in this topic because um, I think it's the kind of topic that often people will say, they just kind of shake their heads and they're like, oh, well, what are you going to do about it? Like, they've already given up on it before we even have a conversation, right? Because it just seems so daunting, right? You know, we deal with it probably every day, especially if you're working in organizing politics, you just can't believe what you have to face every single day, right? Is that right? How many of you organize or work in advocacy? Oh, I get out of You're on the front lines of polarization, right? So, um, so I want to talk about the work we've been doing because um, it's been a real journey for us in trying to um, figure out how to not only deal with it and make progress, but also, um, you know, it, it's been a more personal journey, really. Partly because, well, let me explain. You know, Eric was born in Northern Virginia, he grew up in Northern Virginia. I, grew, I was born in South Korea uh, and came to America when I was nine and I grew up in Houston, Texas, basically. So we spent our childhoods in the South, right? And, uh, yeah, <laughs> right, special, special part of South. Um, and I think, you know, part of uh, what's been frustrating is feeling like, you know, that is part of the polarization that we're not talking about, like the north-south divide, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, you're going to see a little bit of the video we did with Reverend Barber at NWCP, where he talks about what's happening right now as a kind of third attempt at reconstructing the south, right? And friends in the northeast, like, they have this attitude, like, 
Oh, like you can't talk about the South really because you know it's such a mess. The South is such a mess. Um, I don't know if you get that from your friends in the Northeast. Um, and and there's no, I don't feel like there's been a real attempt to talk about some of the divisions that are cultural, political, psychological, emotional, right? And so that's kind of behind um, what's what we're doing with Story America. We're not saying, oh, let's talk about the North-South divide. We're, what we are trying to get Americans to really, you know, face, you know, our history and put some of the current political issues in that historical context, right? You know, because history can provide real common ground and a set of facts that people can actually agree with because they're you know, often in textbooks. And, uh, and then and see if we can make some progress in that. So that's kind of like our organizing strategy behind the story of America. Right? Because in some ways, like, you know, we're, we say we're, we're filmmakers and organizers, but in, in reality, we're organizers first. We want progress in America. And we're using film to get there. Right? So film is, what is film? I mean, film is... To me, like you know, a tool for storytelling, and the reason why storytelling is so important to organizing to me is, you know, that's what we do most of the time when we're organizing is telling a story, right? When you write a press release, you do an email blast, you're, talk you're talking to someone. It's often about what is the story and what are talking points, but just like your your our attempt to control the story and the narrative. Right? And so as filmmakers, you know, in 2006 when YouTube started to really blow up as a medium for politics, we, you know, that's when we started to really combine our passion for film with our you know, real desire for progress. And started making YouTube videos to like, try to contribute to the narrative so that it's not always dominated by cable news and the extremists that are the loudest, right? So that's basically our theory of change is, you know, we want to figure out how we can bring people into the kind of story that is based in reality, that's inclusive, that can help us have the kind of dialogue we need to have, desperately need to have, in order to make good decisions about the future. Because if we're not talking to each other, Right? We're in a democracy. We have one federal government. If we're not talking to each other, can we really have a democracy? You know, it just seems more of a power struggle at that point. But we're not able to have a conversation. Right? And that's the sad state right now. It's like most people have given up on that dialogue. Because if you try to engage in an issue, you know, money in politics, or, or you know, uh, social security, or health, or any of these issues, you're often confronted with an opponent who's very, often very uncivil, uses a lot of propaganda, and misinforms the public, and then you're like, oh my god, I can't believe he just said that, or I can't believe people believe that, and then what do you do? Right? So I almost feel like it just, We've, we've lost people we get started because we can't get people to think about and talk about the truth. Right? So that's that's why um, you know it sounds depressing, but I'm also hopeful because with YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and all the social media out there, we actually have now tools that we've never had before. Never had. Before. You know, it's like, you know, Coffee Party is a good example. We was a Facebook page that went super viral, and now there are about half a million people in the network. It's like, it, and there was no money behind it, no planning behind it. It just happened. And so then, you know, I, we just, that couldn't have happened before Facebook, right? And so we're in kind of uncharted territory with both this kind of, like, suffocating gridlock happening. At the same time, you have this kind of opening up 
of communication. So you have people all over the country suddenly having a voice because they have, you know, 20,000 followers on Twitter or they have a Facebook page with a million people on it that they just started with a clever name, right? Suddenly, these people have voices. Yes. Yeah, but then, in addition to that, you have now another divide. Mm -hmm. You have your generation out there who just understands that whole technology from the beginning. You grew up with computers. You probably never even knew a day when there wasn't a computer. One of my granddaughters discovered a typewriter in our house and said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that young. <laughs> I remember typewriters. <laughs> very hard divide to get over because the learning curve is not for the young, it's for the old. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm on Facebook a lot, <laughs> and I see people of all ages, and some of the most active people I know on Facebook are actually retired people, because they have time, and they learn how to use Facebook, you know, so, I mean, I see, I see retired people well, they, because they write to me all the time. <laughs> I get tons of messages from people, and I, I know that um, that divide is not insurmountable. That's true. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm sure most of you guys are probably on Facebook, right? You know, and your friends are on Facebook. So this is an amazing situation and a tool that we, as as soon as we figure out how to capitalize more on this. It, it just completely changes the playing field, completely changes the game. So that's why I'm hopeful. So we have to kind of think of ourselves as being part of this new experiment. Where no one knows like what the outcome is going to be. But we can all try our best, put our energy into just seeing what we can do, see if we can use these new tools to actually create a network. Imagine if we had a million, 10 million, 20 million people in one network, right? The kind of impact we could have on elections or any kind of advocacy. So in some ways, it's all mathematical. How can we pull our networks? Because even in just this room, if we pulled our networks, you know, and then the extension of it, we would probably start to number in hundreds of thousands of people that we could influence right now. Uh, as a result of the gerrymandering that took place after the... Gerrymandering? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. uh, does the fact that you can get a network uh, 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 make, makes it still uh, difficult or impossible uh, to do anything because of gerrymandering? Yeah, but gerrymandering came about because they had a strategy. They won the 2010 so for the next election, the next time there's gerrymandering, we can be prepared because now we know where they're gay, right? So, you know, it's part of it is part, yeah. Yeah. But part of it, though, is, you know, still the same kind of, kind of art of war. Like, we have to know their tactics, right? And be prepared. And, and, and surprise them with our own tactics, right? Um, I know that sounded a bit polarizing. <laughs> I didn't mean to say all Republicans are opponents because I want to talk about not actually thinking that way. But I want to I want to entertain you a little bit with some videos before I, I go there. Okay. So this is the film that we did, 9500 Liberty. I'm going to show you a little bit of the trailer. <coughs>
There is unrestrained hatred, confrontation, and name calling. The man hanging here has become a symbol of racial tensions in Prince William County. Immigration remains a hot button issue across the area. I want you to get rid of every one of those illegals. And I said, how do you expect us to get rid of them? And he said to me, you put them in a boxcar and you ship them out. We are going to repel this invasion. One way or another, it will be repelled. You can either be part of that repulsion. One day, my little one asked me, you know, Dad, if people don't like us, why don't we just move out? Oh, not a day goes by that I don't get called a racist. If that is the only argument that they can bring, it is a demonstration that we're being effective. Illegal. 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 If y'all haven't took a look outside, please do. We are out here, and we ain't going nowhere. The police officer in Texas could probably arrest someone coming across the border because they are committing a misdemeanor in their presence. I'm a long ways from the border. God instituted this government. This is part of his plan. Those leaders aren't just there for a win. They're there because God has purposes. We need all of your support. We got a tough election. It's a election that is on the local level. It's about an election, honey. It's about an election, and it got out of hand. Learn how to speak hey, English. I speak English just fine. You do, but yeah. these people don't. But we we have. I'm sorry, y'all, yeah. because there are 12 million illegals in this country. Do I have to carry this around everywhere that I go because of the way that I look? I mean, I don't think that I should. Racial profiling, that is, taking action against someone because of their race, free the color, is wrong. It's against federal law, it's against our policy. It is the first step to taking back our communities and our neighborhoods. I would just like to say, and I mean this very sincerely, don't ever forget 9-11. And who was responsible for 9-11? Illegals. God bless America. <laughs> I think the biggest impact has been in the local housing market. <laughs> okay. Yeah, did you know that illegals were responsible for 9 11? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Prince William County, Virginia, which is about 30 miles south of DC. It's a, it's a suburb, very wealthy suburb, that um, passed something like SB 1070 before Arizona did. And in fact, it was kind of a test case. Not only for that particular policy, but it turns out the Republican Party and the national and immigration nativist groups decided this would be an interesting electoral strategy. Maybe we could make illegal immigration the issue in, for the 2008 election. So they were testing it out in Prince County, and we have footage of that, of, of someone from the, the nativist group actually explaining it to us, <laughs> that that's what happened. That's not just a conspiracy. They really got together and said, hey, this is, a, this is going to be the issue that is going to affect 2008. Didn't go that well, actually. Not well enough, because people eventually rose up built a coalition of a lot of people who are just members of the community, not just the immigrants um, who are organizing under the banner Mexicans Without Borders, which is a terrible name for the group, <laughs> and then Help Save Manassas, which was the anti-immigrant group. So you had these two, ex two groups screaming <coughs> at each other, and in some cases threatening violence. And, and some of us thought, oh my god, we could have a civil war over immigration policy, the way these people are acting. And remember, this is Manassas, like the start of the first battle of the civil war. You know, and I think some of the people in the reenactment community were part of Help Save Manassas, which is all very crazy, but it really did happen. But people in the community came together eventually and said, okay, we've got to change this policy. Because it's not only polarizing people, but it's actually hurting the economy. Because as soon as the immigrants started leaving, their housing prices dropped. So in some cases, like by 40, 50 percent. In case, in, in fact, the guy who was, say, the, the main organizer, you know, basically 
his housing price would drop by 40% because of all the immigrants leaving. But no one was really making making the dots. You know, they, they just weren't connecting the dots. And then and what we did was we were able to use our YouTube channel that we created to start informing people. Like, yeah. I'm not connecting the dots. The, the housing prices dropped because of a drop, in, a drop in demand because people were leaving? Is that, yeah, yeah, so all okay. the immigrants started leaving at once. Yeah, okay. A community okay, where so, so no demand for housing because the population was falling. Yeah, okay. Okay. yeah, I mean, they were just, you know, abandoning their homes mm -hmm. overnight. Mm -hmm. So if suddenly half your neighborhood is gone, mm -hmm. right? Your, your housing prices would go down, right? And also the tax revenue starts to go down because, yeah. in, in, you know, many of these immigrants were actually you know, paying taxes, at least sales tax, property tax, and, and many of them also income tax. So they're, they're prop, the, the tax revenue start to shrink, and also to implement this policy, they have to spend money that they didn't have, right, in the, in the county. So for a variety of reasons, it, was, it had a devastating economic impact. And so when people start to see that, they, that's when they really started to form this coalition. Right? And so the, the, one of the things that I learned, though, was to really change the policy wasn't a matter of Mexicans without borders suddenly having greater influence. It was the people who were in the middle who are not activists, but who most of the time you know, sit on the sidelines, who have to be brought into the dialogue and organize and make this change. So that's really the focus that I, you know, I really want to have for today's conversation is, often we're very good at organizing the base. Okay. But we're not, we're not as good at persuading the middle and neutralizing the opponent. We have to figure out how to persuade the middle to not only get informed, but to get involved. But it starts with often information and dialogue. So I'm a big you know, proponent of dialogue partly because it's, um, I think it's just a good thing for our democracy, but also because I think it's, it's necessary for the kind of progress that probably most of us can agree on. You know, things like equality. <laughs> I mean, things that most of us can agree on. I don't think we can get there until we can have that conversation, including people who are now um, in the middle or on the fence, or they might agree with us, but they're doing nothing about it, not even voting. You know? So they, we have the same opinions, but they don't go vote. Or they never make calls. Or they just never go beyond just shaking their heads about something to taking action. So that's where, to me, that's where we could really start to have some game-changing tactics, is how do we better persuade the middle, include them, inspire them to, to be involved in the process. So um, I'm going to show you another video. Um, okay, so this, I'm sure you remember what this is. Tell you about a group that started on Facebook a couple of weeks ago. I kind of lost it and started ranting on my Facebook page about frustration I felt listening to news coverage that made it seem like the Tea Party was um, representative of America. I completely disagree with this. And I started you know, writing comments about it on my Facebook page, and then there was a flurry of <laughs> instant feedback from other people who agreed with me and similarly felt pent up and frustrated. The group was called the Coffee Party Movement, and obviously we're referencing the Tea Party, that we're an alternative to the Tea Party, and we want to see cooperation um, in among people in Congress and in government, 
And we want to see people who are representing us move towards solutions to the problems instead of, you know, strategically obstructing any form of progress. Many people believe this is an effective electoral strategy to win you know, Republican seats in 2010, and we object to ob obstructionism and extreme political tactics that are, I think, um, are fear-based, not reality-based, and in many ways, just deliberate misinformation. So we're organizing. We want people to understand that we're voters, that we're going to come out to vote. We're going to participate in the process. We're going to make sure that we hold people accountable for obstructing progress in government. We need everyone engaged in the political process. That is the only way our government can function as an expression of our collective will. So, actually, this was um, shot and uploaded almost exactly three years ago. <laughs> So if you can remember back years ago was when we were having all the crazy, you know, discourse about healthcare. <laughs> and, and I don't know about you guys, we're going, what is going on in this country? This is about if reforming insurance policy, mostly. <laughs> you know, how can people get so angry? <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, to, spitting at our congressmen and you know, calling our president names, like, it was, it was shocking to me. But then I wasn't shocked because of what I saw in Prince County. These are the same tactics, different issues. Same tactics. But what happens is, what these tactics not only have the effect right now of dominating discourse, because cable news loves it, they eat it up, that's what they report on, right? Not CBO reports, but they report on, oh, this is what such and such person said. What do you think? And, and you know, just have this kind of wrestling match. And then no, no one gets real information. They just get a wrestling match, right? So, so there are two bad things about it, that we are watching this, not getting information, and this is part of their strategy, is that we become disengaged. Well, maybe not the people in this room, you probably got very engaged, but a lot of people in the middle, ordinary Americans, they get disengaged. They want to turn it off. It's like, okay, I can't deal with this. They're all a bunch of hooligans. I'm going to just shut down. I'm not going to deal with it. Politics is dirty and nasty, and nothing's going to change. They get cynical. They disengage. So these extreme polarizing rhetoric have that in, that effect of disengagement, and that is really, to me, where the biggest problem is in our politics is disengagement, right? And so that and that's where we can make a lot of progress. We can make a lot of progress with even, you know raising, increasing voter turnout by a few percent. But imagine if we set as a goal voter turnout at something like 70 percent for not just presidential elections, but for midterms, for local elections. 70 percent of our registered voters wanted to vote. We would have a completely different kind of government at every level. So that is something that we can work on, is when there is greater voter turnout, it's usually good for democracy and good for progress. So just strategically speaking, I think focusing on turnout and increasing participation, period, is a good way to go. And that requires, and this is what mostly what the Coffee Party messaging was about, is we need to establish some ground rules for participation. One of them has to be that we engage in civil dialogue. Another one has to be we have to care about facts. We can't just have conversations with zingers and clever, snarky comments. We need facts 
and we have to insist on it. We have to have a culture where we insist on facts and we hold liars accountable for lying. And not get <laughs> Can we explore that for a while? Because yeah. one of the downsides of the internet is that you can, you know, any, anybody sitting around a computer can just put into Google Annabelle Park Antichrist and then say, look, it, it says it on the internet. It's, you are the Antichrist. I <laughs> guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whether, you know, it could be sea level, fake, it doesn't matter. It's just easy to pull up yes. fake facts. You Googled me, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote paper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're saying that some people lie on the internet. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no this is the problem. I think there's a problem with the General Assembly right now. They actually believe it. Yeah. They're not lying. They believe it. Yeah. They believe their lies. Right. That is a problem. Yes. Yeah, okay. As a footnote to his remark. Uh -huh. I'm a retired reference librarian, and of course the internet did a lot to, to transform my occupation. But something we constantly had to stress with our library patrons was, there is no quality control on the internet. You've got to be careful of your, your source yeah. if you're going to use the internet for information. Right, yeah, that's true. And sometimes, sometimes they got it, sometimes they didn't. Yeah, yeah. It's true, absolutely. So it's not like the internet is somehow advantages the truth for us, right? It just it's a it's a value neutral tool that we can use, like a car. It's a it's a form of transportation. It can help us get from point A to point B, but we really have to drive it. Right? We still have to engage with other people who are trying to take us backwards, right? So it's true, it's, it, it, internet isn't always this positive thing, it's, but it is a very powerful tool that we can use. So I don't mean to say that if everyone's on the internet, somehow everything will be better, because I know that's not true. And I'm not the Antichrist, but I'm sure some people <laughs> want to believe I am. <laughs> Let's see. Um, okay, so... Um, it's, this is related to your question, so I'm going to play a little bit of this. This is uh, our latest video. Speaking out has been healing. Um, and it's healing because as a human, I want to help. That's why I went into law enforcement. I wanted to make a difference. Um, I did make a difference. When it happened, I couldn't act as a law enforcement officer. I couldn't prevent it. It happened. I couldn't be there as a first responder. It's too late. There's nobody to save. Now we're left with a community that's fractured. This was about the moment where I was standing in front of the fire department and I said, the school is on the roof, back this way. lived all over the world and finally I had a home and um, now that we moved here I was given an amazing opportunity to photograph one of the most sweet towns that I've ever lived in. When the incident happened, um, within days, I saw the images appearing on Facebook and on the news and I couldn't watch and, and it dawned on me, I thought, what are you going to do? As a photographer, as a, as a, a, I'm not a photojournalist. I don't want to be a photojournalist. I don't want to document tragedy. But we would be going to the grocery and the traffic jams, and you know, the photographers, though I don't know where they were driving from, were still arriving three and four days later and parking their cars a mile away from the school and running with their cameras like there was something to still capture days later. And it got me thinking, if these people are traveling all over, from all over the world to document this, and I was like, for what? And then it dawned on me, I'm like, this is, this is my town. What can I do to document it, and can I? And I told George, I said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to photograph it. I'm going to try to find the beauty in this, if there is any. Some people that we know may never go 
to the memorial. They may never have seen the, the little notes, the little candles, the little bears. If I can capture it, I can show the families their child's name on a card, on a teddy bear, on a something. I've never seen so many candles. I've never seen so many cards. I've never seen so many. And it was the notes that got to me. It was the, the personal little notes from other children, other children that knew them, other children from the school system. Um, and one note in particular is burned into my, my memory of um, happening right before Christmas is just another level of pain that has to be um, dealt with. And the card was, it was a handwritten letter on a piece of white paper and it had a picture of Santa. And the note said, I hope Santa makes you better. that has to address the horror to be armed and they don't want well, to take don't. Okay. Um, I just want to give you a flavor. You know, I, I try to have a discussion with this guy and, and you should watch it. A lot you of people seem to job. like it. This is our most popular video. You did a great job. Oh, thank you. Um, because you kind of see his argument breaking down eventually after I keep like pushing him. <laughs> but, you blamed um, it on the coffee. <laughs> he has his coffee <laughs> He did spill it 
uh, this is my pencil. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, you know, what I'm trying to say is, right now the debate is gridlocked. We're not making a lot of progress with it, because you have someone like Wayne LaPierre of the NRA, you know, and then you have others who um, are just, they're just clashing right now. And it's very hard to humanize this conversation and, and bring people into it, not as opponents, because right now people into the debate already taking their position. You're in that square, I'm in that corner, and we're just going into it like it's a wrestling match. But I think what Darren does is he he is advocating for gun control. He is speaking up, but he's speaking up as a person with these feelings and these um, you know, experiences, and you know, just really ex in a way exposing himself and his humanity so that we could humanize this conversation. So we're not just screaming at each other, right? And so that's, that's the kind of thing I think that brings more people into it. Like they can relate to him, right? They can relate, they know someone just like him. They, he's like my neighbor, he's like my brother. And then they feel like, okay, he's speaking up. I'm gonna start speaking up. And it encourages people to engage and participate. So it has those two <coughs> effects. It, it humanizes a debate and it encourages Participation, right? So that I mean, so that's the general approach. Um, I want to play this thing that is specific to your situation. You probably know Reverend Barber. Um, My father had a master's degree, but in the South, he didn't have protective voting rights. So when we talk about this history of voting rights, I'm born in 63, that means in my lifetime, this is not some ancient history, it's only been in my lifetime that we've had the protection of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So when I say to people when you talk about voting rights and why people get so upset when people now today try to come up with 21st century versions of voter suppression and 21st century versions of Jim Crow and poll taxing, and they act as though, what's wrong? Why are you all complaining? They are ahistorical. After the Civil War, something phenomenal happened called fusion politics, unique to the South. Lincoln Republicans joined with former slaves or freedmen to rewrite constitutions all over the South, right here in North Carolina. 1868, they rewrote the Constitution. The promise of the Reconstruction was that we're going to reconstruct the nation to be more close to its noble ideas, what it said on paper, not what it did in practice. By 1870, in North Carolina, you had more African Americans serving in the General Assembly than you have today. Those legislators joined with progressive whites wrote some of the most progressive education laws, labor laws, voting laws, criminal justice laws. I'm talking 144 years ago. By 1872, however, there was a violent reaction by the former planters, and they called it the redemption movement. They needed to redeem America, in particular the South, from the influence of black political power. So, um, let's see, I'm going to try to rush through because <laughs> we have only a few minutes left. But um, this is another video that you should watch on our channel. Um, I have business cards, by the way, that you can, you can take, but this is on our YouTube channel, Story of America. And um, it's, I think that, um, how many of you are attending the march tomorrow? Oh, great, because we're going to be documented, so you might be in our movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I think what he says here is such an important story about America that most people in America, I bet, don't really know. Like, they have a vague understanding of what happened with Jim Crow. They know it was a bad era. They know some bad things happened, but they don't really know in a, in a way that where they can, again, connect the dots between what's happening now with what's happened in our history. You know, and you know from living here, 
that there are dynamics from the Civil War that are still in play here. But most of this country, like they just don't even think about it. They don't think about the Civil War. Uh, just connecting the dots again, Prince William County is one of the few counties in Virginia that actually shut its schools in, uh, during massive resistance. So I mean, there it's exactly. within a lot of their lifetime, and they're doing it again. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, you know, the, the the fact that we're ahistorical is a problem. And again, there's room. This is where there's room for progress. Is we can if we can get people to learn about history, think about it and put things into that framework, context, then we're going to start to, I think, see people change their mind, change, their, change the way they see something. It's not just changing their opinion, it's changing the perception, because as soon as they see it, they realize, OK, I've, this, is, this is just like Jim Crow, <laughs> right? Um, and so, so that's kind of you know, what we're trying to do with our project is use all these skills that we have and you know even though we don't have a lot of financial resources we are able to have enough to make these little documentaries that hopefully will reach a lot of people i mean we just started in november we reached you know we, there are like 150,000 views or something but hopefully we're going to be able to have millions of people just like i thought my liberty and to have ended up having millions of viewers. And we're especially interested in North Carolina because of the situation that you're in, which is very unfortunate, you know, dealing with this, you know, a, a very, um, what Reverend Barber would say, regressive state government right now. So you're definitely in a tough battle, and, and so we're, we're going to be here a lot <laughs> documenting it. So um, any, any Questions before I wrap up? I, I did want to show others, but we don't have time. Yeah. Is there or will there be a local coffee farm? You know, um, there was, I think, a local um, Durham rally when, when it first started. But I don't, I mean, I mean, we have a database, but I don't think that it's active. But if you're interested, <laughs> I mean, it's a very simple concept. You just, it's about having people talk to each other over coffee and connecting as fellow Americans and see if we can problem solve. So we try to get people to not talk about, you know, what party they're in, but more about, okay, this is the problem, not in politics. Let's learn about it, let's problem solve, and let's organize. So yeah, let's talk, Emma. Do you feel like in any way that social media, public comments on websites like YouTube is actually contributing to the polarization because mm -hmm. whereas years yeah. ago, I may not know my neighbor's opinion on an issue like guns or gay marriage or anything like that, mm -hmm. or even a family member. It's just things that don't come up in everyday topics mm -hmm. of conversation, yet somehow people are willing to post it on Facebook and to even, and, and then comment on something you posted that was mm -hmm. perfectly innocent, and now you've got this fight that yeah. wouldn't have been there decades ago, mm -hmm. but now it is, and it's for the whole public to see. Yeah, I mean, I think we have right now, you know, very low standard for what passes as constructive dialogue or comment. So if we can change the terms so that, you know, we demand civility and respect you can talk about anything, and you can disagree about anything, and it's okay. It's all part of the free marketplace of ideas. And you can disagree with someone and not be enemies. But right now, you know, the way just kind of, it's a norm. The social norm is, you're my enemy if you believe this and you object to this. And we suddenly are we're enemies, right? <laughs> And so I think you know we can really create a culture where we talk about anything and not say, well, we don't talk about that. We talk about it, but we do it respectfully. And I think we can change the norm. We have to demand it and reset it so that you know we can make we can talk and and make progress together. Because right now our country's in gridlock, and it's really hurting. It's really hurting us. It's, you know, our, uh, we got downgraded because 
our dysfunctional government by Moody's. I mean, even these things happen because we're in gridlock. Well, we have a very functional government in North Carolina. I mean, it really is. It, 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 it's just functioning very well, I think, as, as government's function. It's just dystopic or dyspeptic or one of those things. So it's, it's, not, it's not the function that, that makes a difference. It's where it's going. Right. Well, it's, there are two. In D.C., there's gridlock. In North Carolina, there's regression. <laughs> so, I mean, there are different problems, but I think the solution to me is still about you know, engaging and informing the middle. You know, and we can get better at that. Yes. So. A lot of what you're saying really resonates with me. I mean, partly because I come from a family that is more conservative. My parents are sort of the most progressive of their family members, and I have you know cousins who. I think identify as Republicans but aren't crazy right wingers and so we've had some conversations that mm -hmm. surprised ourselves where I struggle as an individual and then working as with, I work with Democracy North Carolina working for an organization and a, in a movement with the Justice Center and other groups that I think really believes we have to we always talk about the movable middle and reaching them but I think we've still struggled with how to do that mm -hmm. what resources we need to put into it and then the balance between having that long view, because it is a long view, to think about moving the middle to where they're engaged versus reacting to the very regressive, very real things that are happening right now in North Carolina around voting rights and unemployment and um, guns and education. So uh, I'm, I'm not trying to be skeptical or cynical, but I just really struggle and think a lot of us do with what we can start doing now and then how to keep that long view when our resources are very much devoted to just fending off the worst of what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, these are definitely organizing challenges, but um, I think um, I, I still I still think that you know if we can, and this is an immediate thing too, if we can really focus on you know, really creating that culture of civil dialogue and injecting humanity and information. I believe in the American people, basically. You know, I'm very pro-enlightenment. I believe we're capable of rational reasoning and governance. You know? But people have to be informed. How can that be done without talking about Wall Street? <laughs> oh, we got to talk about Wall Street. <laughs> oh, we got to talk about Wall Street. Not only Wall Street. Yeah. But the history. Yeah. Wall Street calls the Great Depression. Yeah. It also calls the Great Recession. The Usury Act was repealed under Carter. Mm -hmm. This the Glass Steagall Act was repealed under Clinton. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you got you got big you got big money mm -hmm. and you got politics and these guys go to Washington Washington. Even though this so called uh, finance, whatever was changed, nothing really changed. Absolutely, I totally agree. It's you one had, of my favorite topics you of had, conversation. You had Chris Dodd in yeah. Connecticut mm -hmm. who watered down that finance act. You had Walkers in Montana who watered down Obamacare. You got all that stuff out there. Yeah, absolutely. Why not share it with the people so they can connect the dots? Yeah. And know well, that big money is driving everything. Yeah. It well, has hollowed out the middle class. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in fact, that's a definitely a big subject for the documentary series we're doing. And you know we have some videos that uh, address this. And Coffee Party is really focused on Wall Street reform. So we are definitely going to cover this. And I completely agree with you that that's really where the center of power is that we have to change. Um, sorry, Chris, I went on too long. <laughs> if you want to stay longer, yeah, I would be, I'd be here. Uh, let's give our Annabelle a hand. <laughs> I cut it short. I know a lot of folks have to have to uh, go organize. <laughs> I do want to make one correction. We had two separate dates for the uh, the, ne the next one about dark, big money and dark money. It's actually the 21st, so you can still have a nice Valentine's Day lunch with your with your with your partner, uh, and then come the 21st to uh, to see that. And I hope we'll all go to the Coffee Party website and watch this. I hope we'll all see all of you at HKMJ. Um, and I, I want to just make one personal uh, get on my personal bully pulpit for one second. 
Uh, and, and say two things. One is that I think the key is everybody being informed is the very first thing. And I would, I would agree that we have to reach the middle, but there are a whole lot of people in our base that have no idea right now what is happening in North Carolina. And I think that's part of the struggle, too, is just actually letting people know what's actually at stake and what's going on, and especially for us in our General Assembly and the people who are laid off, who are about to be hurt, the people who uh, uh, are not going to have health care because of what's happening, the environment that's going to be ruined, and a lot of other things that are happening in the next six months unless we actually let people know. And that's what tomorrow is all about at HKMJ. So thank you for coming. Uh, please uh, have some coffee on your way out. Talk to Annabelle, and we really appreciate it. We'll see you uh, on the 21st. Uh, one quick thing. I'd just like to publicly thank you for your work. Um, yeah, me too. For the right reason. Um, every time you are on NC Spin, and it's being I can only really imagine. However, you hold your own very well, but you're very articulate. And the other part of it is, is your presence on the web is very much appreciated. I, I read it weekly, multiple times. And I just want to say that you're appreciated out there. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Sure. And thank you for coming. Can't say that'd be great. I have business cards, and the website is actually storyofamerica.org. Um, and uh, I, but I have cards if you want to.